were my feet. And um, as an officer in the Royal Marines, a runner, a climber, and a skier, I used to think my feet were quite literally the foundation of my life. Um, and it was that job as an officer in the Marines that took me to this place here, Patrol Base Maboub um, in Sangin, Afghanistan, in March 2010, so about eight years ago. And um, at the time, Sangin was being touted by the press as being the most dangerous town on earth. And Patrol Base Maboub within our unit, and when we were deploying there, we were being told this was one of the most uh, dangerous patrol bases to go to. And uh, it didn't take long for us to face that danger. Within a couple of weeks, I'd been shot at for the first time. And the first time it happened, we were just out on the streets. Um, a guy took a couple of pop shots. They just went over the top of our heads. Um, the adrenaline started pumping, my heart was racing, but in that case we were very lucky to be able to get to safety very quickly. The next time we were shot at though, um, one of my men was actually on top of the building right in the middle um, of this picture here in the patrol base and the shot rang out and then the cry of casualty um, went out across the uh, patrol base and that shot was quickly followed up by many more. What happened then, we had a half hour firefight and uh, I can tell you the adrenaline really got pumping this time and not only that, I was having to try and coordinate things with this casualty to make sure he was getting first aid and uh, organising the evacuation for him out of there too. The slightly perverse thing about that firefight and others is um, we actually started to enjoy them a little bit. There was something about a firefight where it almost seemed fair you kind of knew where the enemy were, you knew what they were doing, and um, it seemed like a fair fight and was kind of the ultimate adrenaline rush. And I don't really know what to make of that now um, that I've come back, but it was just one of those things. So um, what motivated us to put ourselves in, in front of that danger? You know, I'm not sure when I joined the Marines or even when I deployed on this tour to Afghanistan, I'm not sure that I did fully understand my motivation. However, once I got out there, um, I pretty quickly did work out what my motivation um, was. And that was seeing children like this, family like, um, families like these, um, who actually no different to the children that I've got at home now yet they had to live their life in permanent danger and fear. And men in my troop also had children of a similar age, and that was something that we were able to sort of galvanize um, our resolve around, that idea that actually what we were gonna do is try and make their lives a little bit safer and a little bit better on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I've talked about the danger of firefights, but here was a even scarier danger, and these are IEDs, Improvised Explosive Devices, or Homemade Bombs. And these two were ones that my men actually discovered a couple of hundred meters outside our patrol base. And on this occasion, uh, we were lucky enough to spot them in the ground. Um, the guys uncovered enough of them to confirm what they were, and then we were able to secure the area make sure there are no civilians around, and then call in a specialist team, the EOD team, Explosive, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team. And that team came down, put their own um, explosive charges on top of those bombs, and blew them up in place under control. But that meant they were no, no longer of any danger to anyone else. Now, I'm just going to talk you through this picture here to give you an idea of... Um, kind of the, the pressure we were under whilst we were on patrol. So I took this picture, um, and again, just a couple of hundred meters outside our uh, patrol base. And I'm just gonna um, sit here and use my cursor so I can point things out to you. Um, so what's happened is, this is our front man in the patrol, and you can see his metal detector lying uh, next to him here and his weapon. Um, when we used to patrol, we used to walk in single file, and the front man would be scanning the ground with this metal detector looking for signs of increased metal in the ground that could be a bomb. Um, on this occasion, what we've got is a lane with a wall of equal height on the other side and then a crossroads in the lane here. And this guy here has spotted a cable coming out of the wall and disappearing into the ground. Now, you need to appreciate this isn't London. Um, they don't have fiber optic broadband kicking about the place. Um, mo most of the houses genuinely don't have electricity. 
And so when we see cables coming out of the walls and disappearing into the ground, what we're thinking is there's probably a bomb at one end and a trigger with someone holding that trigger at the other end. So on this occasion, the guy's just uncovering the wire to try and get an idea of where it might be going. And we think it's pretty obvious. Um, we think it's probably in this patch of disturbed grey soil that you can see in the middle of the picture here. Now, normally in such a position, um, we wouldn't put a second man so close because clearly um, we're, we're putting more people in danger um, if a bomb goes off. However, because of the nature of the walls and the fact that the first man had to lie down, uh, we felt there was a credible um, threat of the front man being shot at, so hence we took the risk and moved the second man up. So we decided we had seen enough and called in the EOD team again, but on this occasion they weren't actually available to come out that afternoon. So we had to come back to our patrol base for the evening, go out the next morning when the EOD team was available, clear the area again, make sure there are no civilians and um, secure it, and then let the EOD team do their fine search of the area. And um, this is what we discovered, or the EOD team discovered. The, the wire coming out of the wall here disappeared all the way along here, through the ground, into a ditch there, and they never actually found the end of it. But when they were uncovering that wire, um, they found another wire, which basically ran um, from the buildings up here all the way down the ditch, um, underneath that patch of disturbed soil, and to a bomb right underneath this guy's knee here. Um, and the bit I haven't told you about was the afternoon before when we had been there, just before we pulled back to our patrol base. Uh, we stopped a local national who was coming up the lane from the left-hand side there, um, and we questioned him about where he was going, and uh, he said he was heading up to those buildings um, to go and see his family, which we thought was a bit odd at the time, because we knew that those buildings had been abandoned for a long time. Um, because of his age, we took his photograph, and that night we went back and um, compared his photograph to our um, intelligence database and found out that he was actually the local Taliban commander's little brother. Um, so quite clearly on this case, heading up to the trigger point for the bomb that was right underneath my men there. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of the sort of pressure we were under. And I'll, I'll be honest, that was um, a bit of a, a moment for us where we realised just how endangered we were out there and um, we, we kind of had no idea really. Our, our realisation of the risk just increased massively. Um, so I'm going to fast forward um, probably about six or so tragic, exciting, at times boring, lots of other things going on weeks um, to the 16th of June 2010 and this was the day that I got blown up. And just to give you some context again, um, the first bombs that I showed you were up in this area here. This blue box is our patrol base, patrol base Maboob, and the last pictures you saw were just off the screens, um, just, or just off this screen um, down here. And on the, the 16th of June 2010, the plan was to go up to uh, this farmstead up here, and that was on top of a hill that overlooked our patrol base. There was just one farmer that lived there, probably in his 70s, kind of kept himself to himself, um, just literally a little small holding with a few chickens, goats, and some vegetables. The problem was, his, um, this farmstead, sorry, it's this one here, overlooked our patrol base, and this area here was very much the Taliban headquarters for, uh, for Sangin. We regularly um, were engaged and followed insurgents down into this area and we didn't have any of our own patrol bases in there to secure it. So the Taliban used to come up over the back of the hill um, and try and take over this guy's farm, um, try and interrogate him for information um, and generally make a nuisance of themselves. So it was important for us to go and make sure that he was okay. And we used to do this every couple of weeks. And that's what we were doing this morning. And we left under the cover of darkness about half four in the morning. The reason for that is we had the benefit of night vision goggles, so it meant the time the light came up um, and the Taliban were able to spot us, we could already be halfway towards our intended target. Just before five in the morning, um, the light started to come up and we'd made it to this sort of open ground here. We weren't following the tracks because they're very obvious places for people to hide bombs if they know you're going to walk across them, so we'd kind of zigzag across open ground. 
And um, when the light came up, we stopped, created a little defensive position, and we stayed there for about 10 or 15 minutes. And the reason we do that is take you off your night vision goggles is um, a bit like turning on a bright light in the middle of the night. Um, it takes your eyes a bit of time to, to adjust. Um, so we just waited there for 10, 15 minutes, let our eyes settle, and then we moved off again. And um, there's 11 of us on the ground. I think I was number seven in the patrol. And I remember um, watching the lead guys in the patrol just walk up onto uh, close to the brow of the hill here to walk around here. And the last thing I remember is looking up at the grey dawn sky. Um, my world has just gone into slow motion. I know I'm flying. And I just think to myself, oh, fuck, it's me. Literally, those words went through my head. Um, I landed on the ground with an impact, and everything suddenly started going into fast forward. And what I'm about to describe to you here is what I call the ultimate team event. And it's kind of no longer about me, but about everyone else that was around me. And the journey from there back to Birmingham in, in three days. So, I've described what happened to me. My memory is that the first guys got to me to start giving me first aid um, within a couple of seconds. But I'm actually led to believe um, that was wrong. It actually took them a couple of minutes. Now, the first aid manuals will tell you that um, if someone severs a femoral artery, they'll probably die of blood loss in around three minutes. Now, bearing in mind at this stage, I was lying there with both my legs missing and my right arm. Um, I was probably bleeding quite heavily. So I think you'll all agree what they did in 60 seconds to keep me alive in terms of first aid was um, pretty amazing. Um, when they got to me, I was actually on my radio sending um, reports back to the headquarters, um, letting them know what had happened and, um, and telling them what my state is. And um, this is kind of always seen as um, an area where you get a lot of respect brownie points with, uh, within the Marines. If you get injured and you can send your own report, um, people give you a bit more respect. So I was feeling pretty pleased um, that I managed to do this. And um, actually, when we got back to the patrol base, I, I asked the, um, my signaller back in our little headquarters, did you, um, did you get my report? He said, yes, boss, it was brilliant, spot on. Um, a few months later, he was visiting me in Headley Court uh, when I was doing my rehabilitation. He said, boss, about that report, he said, your radio was blown clean off your back. You weren't sending reports to anyone. So um, bless them. They were looking after my ego in the moment. Um, so that was me. We had these guys giving me first aid. Um, and what you need to bear in mind, I was, the, I was the patrol commander on the ground. I was now in no position to... to command that patrol. You know, literally my radio had been blown off and actually there was nothing that I could do. I couldn't see what was going on. So I had a, a corporal on the ground with me um, in his early 20s, a guy called Andy McGarver, and he had to step up and take, take command of that patrol. And he had three things to think about at that um, moment in time. First off, he needed to think about, was I getting the right first aid that I needed? Um, secondly, he needed to think about defending this situation. I've just told you, you know, less than 200 meter w meters away was sort of Taliban headquarters for that area. Um, there's been this huge explosion, big cloud of dust. They'll know exactly where we are and they know that we'll be vulnerable in that moment. So he needs to think about how he's going to defend us. And then thirdly, he needs to think about how he's going to um, coordinate with our little patrol base and um, get me back to the safety of that patrol base. So quite a lot to um, step into. But he was able to do that, um, I'd say, relatively easily. And the reason was is the, the team were all pretty much prepared for this. This is what we're trained for. What happens if? Um, what happens if the worst happens? So the first thing he had to think about was the first aid for me. Well, it just so happened the, the team medic was the man behind me in the patrol. He actually made a dash for me as soon as, I, um, as, soon as he saw where I landed. Um, but luckily, one of the senior Marines grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, um, stopped him charging straight to me. And the reason for that is, if there's one bomb in the area, there could be more. And the last thing we needed was another explosion and more casualties. So they then got the, um, got the spare metal detector out and methodically cleared a route to me. And then those guys just got on with it. So Andy, who is in charge now, um, didn't really have to think about it. He just had to look over his shoulder, see that they were doing the right thing, and then he could carry on with the other tasks. In terms of defending the location, again, the guys were well drilled in this sort of routine. So 
they would have just started getting into their positions themselves. And all Andy would have had to say was, actually, I want you to face a bit more that way. I want you to move a little bit further that way. Um, he wouldn't have had to do too much of that himself. Most of the guys would have just got on and done it. And then the third thing he had to think about, getting me out of there, he could then concentrate. And again, it was something that we always um, spoke about before we went on, on patrol. And uh, we had a quick reaction force, just a four-man team with a quad bike, um, ready to leave the, um, leave the patrol base and come out with that quad bike and pick me up ASAP. So um, that's what was happening next. And in amongst all of that, I actually became unconscious. And you're probably thinking, good, it's probably the best thing that can happen to you when you're in that state. Um, and it would have been, except for, um, firstly, they didn't manage to give me any morphine before I became unconscious. And then when the quad bike arrived, um, the sound of the engine actually woke me up. Because I'd been unconscious, they then weren't allowed to give me any morphine. Um, so, so that was me then, no pain relief. Now, um, the moment I woke up, Jim Wright was the corporal driving the quad bike, and him and I had become pretty good friends over the, over the tour. And he describes this as one of the most surreal moments of his life. He's driving out to me, he's listening to the reports on the radio, and effectively he's expecting to find a, um, a dying or dead mess on the ground. And he turned up and he said, I was just lying there on the stretcher, eyes closed, and then all of a sudden my eyes just bolted up uh, bolted open, I looked up at him and just went, hey up Jim, how are you doing mate? Um, to which he replied, I'm fine mate, how are you? Um, and then the guys giving me first aid said, how the effing hell do you think he is? Um, he's missing three limbs. Um, and at that stage adrenaline just kicked in and that was me then, I was conscious for the next half hour and I, I honestly wasn't feeling any pain at that stage. The body is absolutely miraculous in terms of what it can do. And so the whole way back to the patrol base, I was kind of talking to the guys, I was making some jokes. I'm not a naturally funny guy, um, but I knew I kind of had to do it to make them feel okay and kind of make myself feel okay too. But I remember on the way back having um, this real roller coaster of emotions um, because I remember um, kind of thinking that I might die at this point. And I'd thought about death before and always imagined it to be a very scary thing, the sort of fear of the unknown, the fear of the pain of dying. Um, but actually what happened to me in this moment was in that um, moment, I suddenly had this vision of my mum, my dad, my sister, my friends and family um, all kind of weeping over my death. And um, that was really gut-wrenching and upsetting for me. And that's kind of where I suddenly found this motivation and will just to, just to hold on, hang in there. And then I had this thought that, well, at least I'm going to get out of this place and go home and see my girlfriend, Bex. And um, then I suddenly became overwhelmed with guilt about thinking that I was going to get out of there and I was leaving all my lads behind. So as I say, a real sort of roller coaster of emotions at that stage. The guys got me back to this room here. Um, this isn't actually me on the stretcher. I took this photo a couple of weeks beforehand. Um, this is an Afghan local who was hit by the Afghan police and we were patching him up before we sent him off to hospital. However, um, I will point out, the, this guy here, whose head's looking down, that's Tom Morgan, he was the medic that made the initial chase to me. Um, the little head torch you can see over here is Jay Calvert. He was the guy that stopped Tom um, running to me and then helped Tom give me first aid there and then. And then this guy here is Jim Wright, who was, um, who was driving that uh, quad bike to come and pick me up. So this little group of guys here, absolutely um, all the heroes that helped save me. Um, once we got back here, there was, um, there was a lot going on. Yeah, up until now, I've just really spoken about what was going on in our little 30-man team. Um, but actually, our, our headquarters uh, was speaking to the next level of command up, the company headquarters. They were sending down another support team, the Sergeant Majors Party. Um, now, the Sergeant Majors, the kind of... Um, oldest, grisliest guy in the, in the company. Um, you know, this guy, Buck Ryan, had pretty much um, been in the Marines for 20 of its busiest years and um, had been everywhere and seen everything. And I know in other instances um, like this, where I had still been in charge, it was always a real sort of sense of relief when Buck turned up on the scene um, and you just felt like you had this solid guy that you could um, sit there and depend on. So him and his party were coming down. Um, 
and then the next level up, the commando headquarters, they were speaking back to um, Camp Bastion, which is in the middle of the desert, 100 miles away, and organizing for the helicopters to come and pick me up. Um, two helicopters took off, a uh, British Chinook um, and an American Black Hawk. Now, the Black Hawk was much quicker to take off um, and just carries two effectively paramedics on it. Um, the Chinook, much slower to take off, but a bit quicker once it gets in the air and actually carries a mini surgical team on it. So basically these two helicopters were just in a race to, um, to get to me. And um, Buck was stood where this guy, um, this guy here was uh, with a radio on passing messages to us. And he gave us the message that the helicopters would be landing in five minutes. And so at that point, uh, the guy started putting some clothes back on me, um, putting my helmet and body armor on, strapping me into the stretcher and getting me to the front of the patrol base, ready to get on the helicopter. So you can imagine all of that took a couple of minutes. And once we were there at the front of the patrol base, um, Buck gave us this message, seven minutes until the helicopter is going to land. Um, now you don't need to be a genius to work out that four minutes is just sort of evaporated there. And um, at this point, this was when my adrenaline started to fail, fail me because I went into panic. Um, the reason I went into panic was because over the previous couple of weeks, I had actually listened to two other Marines in patrol bases, in a patrol base close by to me, die on two separate occasions um, when they had been blown up, had injuries similar to mine, um, and in both cases we were listening to their vital signs on the nets, they seemed okay, helicopters were coming in to land. Um, in both cases there was an issue with the helicopter landing and a delay and um, then in both cases we suddenly heard their vital signs drop off and neither of them made it back to Camp Bastion alive. Um, and there was this sudden fear that you know, this was my destiny now and the same was going to happen to me. And I remember at that stage turning around to Buck and just saying, Buck, come on the uh, Chinook with me um, and just get them to put me to sleep. I need to be put to sleep now. Um, excuse me. And that's what happened, the Chinook landed, they got me on there, um, I grabbed the first guy in a flight suit that I saw um, and just screamed at him, put me to effing sleep, put me to effing sleep now. And I remember um, looking out the window um, and seeing the ground move as the helicopter took off, took off. my eyes closed and um, I woke up three days later in, uh, in Birmingham. Um, so this is how it left me, both legs missing above the knee and my right arm missing just above the elbow. Um, and you can see that it wasn't exactly sort of clean cut. The, the blast has obviously degloved quite a lot of flesh there. And that's something I'll come back to later on in, in the talk. So that caused me issues further down the line. Um, but once I arrived in Birmingham, I woke up with my dad and my sister at the end of my bed. Now, you might not think that's too amazing, except for they both lived in Dubai at the time. Um, so in amongst all the teams and organisations that had got me um, safely back to Camp Bastion, um, done the life-saving surgery in the A&E ward there, then flown me back to, um, back to Birmingham, that all happened within 24 hours. My um, girlfriend and my mum were waiting for me at Birmingham because this sort of whole welfare system had kicked into place to inform them and get them to where they needed to be. They had managed to track down my dad and my sister, charter flights for them and get them back to um, the UK. And um, all in all, I'm led to believe that somewhere in the region of sort of six to 700 people would have been involved in that sort of three, three and a half day process. And um, this is not 700 people from one team. This is um, lots of different organisations um, on different continents, at times separated by radio waves, not even sort of um, you know, ca cable broadband or anything like that. Um, and what's amazing is if you speak to uh, A&E consultant in the UK, they'll tell you if someone was to get these injuries on the streets of the UK, there's a good chance they wouldn't make it even if it was right outside a uh, casualty ward. So they really did pull off a miracle. And my belief is the reason they were able to do that was down to their motivation. Um, as far as I'm aware, no one got any honours or awards for what they did in that. Um, but I think everyone had one common goal, um, and that was to get, get me, this guy, John White, back to the UK alive to see his family. 
And I think you'll all agree that's sort of quite an emotional goal. And um, I think if you're looking to do amazing things with your teams, that's what you need to be able to do. You need to find common goals that people can attach an emotion to. It's not enough just to be a figure, a number, with a pound sign in front of it. There's got to be an emotion there, a reason for doing it. So um, I was actually quite lucky because I didn't get any internal injuries, which meant effectively all I needed to do was wait for my skin grafts to heal up, all the wounds to heal up, and I could leave hospital. So I spent just 27 nights in hospital. Um, if I'd known at the time that actually my insurance was paying me per night that I spent in hospital, I would have probably dragged that out a little bit longer. Um, but there we go, lesson learned. Um, this video was actually taken about 10 weeks um, post-injury. So I spent three, uh, four weeks in hospital. Um, three weeks um, I was sent away to my now, uh, at this stage, fiancé. Bex and I went away to a little holiday cottage in the Cotswolds just to kind of go and get our heads around what life might look like in the f future. Um, and then this was within a couple of weeks of starting my rehabilitation at Headley Court. So those are what we call stubbies, the prosthetics I've got. So I'm literally about that tall when I wear them. And we just use them to um, help you sort of retrain your balance and build up core stability. And you can see how much effort that was taking me um, just then, literally just to stand up off the ground. At that stage, the thought that um, you know, within a year I could be standing all day every day on, um, on tall legs like I do now was just absolutely beyond me. Um, this was in the end of October, so we're now, what, four, four months post-injury and I stood up on tall legs similar to the ones I'm wearing today. I didn't actually walk on them um, this day, I just uh, was standing up for a fitting. Um, but then by a year after the injury, I'd given up using a wheelchair and was just walking around full time on my prosthetics. This was 18 months post-injury and I'm out in America here. Um, and the reason I'm out there is because my injuries, as you can tell, are pretty complex and the UK prosthetic services um, didn't really have the skills to sort of match the complexity of my injuries plus my sort of fitness and determination, if you like. Um, and so I went out to this specialist clinic in Oklahoma and one of the things they like to do is um, get you out on a golf course, um, not really to learn to play golf, but actually it's a great place of um, lots of different terrains, um, but in a relatively safe environment. They're big believers that the world is not like a clinic, it doesn't have nice flat floors and handrails everywhere. Um, you can see I'm not really that good and I'm not going to take it up as a hobby. Um, <laughs> And then a couple of weeks later, I managed to um, get back out on the mountains again. Um, I was always a skier before, and I'm now in a position where I can say I'm better at snowboarding now that I'm missing my legs than I used to. Um, and that guy that crashed into me there was actually one of my instructors. Um, this was on a charity trip out to Colorado, and um, all the instructors are paid for. And I actually had three around me. I had one sort of very hands-on, you know, helping me get my balance while I was learning. One a bit more technical, stood off, giving me tips. And then that guy there, his term is, um, he's a blocker, and he's meant to sit 10 or 20 meters behind you and stop people from crashing into you. Um, so life moved on, and I sort of very quickly came around to the idea that um, my career in the Marines was pretty much over. Um, I probably could have hung on for another couple of years and done an admin job somewhere. Um, but by the time I was in a place to do that, I had this realization that I felt like I'd be really frustrated by it. Um, I would be in this environment where um, I used to kind of match everyone else and everyone would still be doing what I used to be able to do and I wouldn't be doing it. Um, so I decided that actually it was time for me to move on. And so I had a couple of things to think about. A, about where I was going to live um, and B, what I was going to do for a career. And I'd considered leaving the Marines before, but having, um, having joined as a 19-year-old, um, bought a couple of properties, so had mortgages and stuff like that to pay, I was suddenly quite scared about the prospect of um, kind of leaving the safety of the, of the military life, and I didn't think I had the skills to make it in the civilian world. So um, I always very quickly switched off that idea and kind of stayed in this really dangerous job because I felt it was more safe for me. 
So I decided to tackle those two problems um, in, a, in a joint manner by building my own house. Me and the family, um, the now growing family, um, to live in. And um, also going in and project managing this for me I just thought would be an absolute great experience. And kind of the result was beyond my dreams, not just in terms of physically. Um, it's a lovely place to be and I was lucky enough for it to feature on Grand Designs. But actually that process of project managing it, um, managing a project that I had absolutely no clue whatsoever about what I was doing. Uh, I didn't have the first idea about building or the building trade and yet somehow I managed to um, pull this off. That kind of really filled me um, with confidence. Um, and I was lucky enough to be joined by these two um, along the way, George and Pippa, who are now uh, five and three. And that's a bit of a miracle in itself because at one stage uh, I was told I was completely infertile and um, I think I was, I was going up to start the process of IVF, IVF um, and then all of a sudden, um, a couple of months before we were due to start that process, um, I had a final test. I was told, well, there might be a chance that you can have um, children yourself and all of a sudden we were able to call up a couple of weeks before the appointment and cancel it. So um, that's, that's a bit of a miracle in itself and these um, are obviously my two biggest motivators now. So what do I do now? Um, this is my business, the White House Future, and I um, basically I call myself a leadership consultant, but I do lots of different things. I give speeches like this, I run leadership training, do one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, and I also manage projects. So at the moment, I'm managing a project for the Royal Foundation, which is Prince Harry and William's um, foundation, and that's uh, introducing a, a mental fitness or psychological fitness program into the Ministry of Defence. Um, as part of the, the leadership work, I kind of realised that my experiences were just my experience and the military is a great place to learn about leadership because it's not just about what you do and what you experience but actually you're in this sort of goldfish bowl where you really get to see everyone around you, all your peers um, and, and all, the, all the people senior to you. Um, you really get a close view at them and how they lead. So you get to learn a lot about it. Um, however, what I decided to do was write a book on leadership as kind of a research project um, to deepen my knowledge. So I'm going out there and interviewing top leaders, Kofi Annan there, um, a couple of sort of four-star generals, CEO of FTSE 100 companies, um, and I'm just sort of talking to a couple of um, sports coaches at the moment as well. And the idea is just to, just to learn from them. Um, and so everything sounds like it's going pretty swimmingly, doesn't it? But uh, four years post-injury, I, um, I was working, I was um, actually just in North London doing some work for London Business School, and I pretty much collapsed one day at work. And um, I'd had this wound on the bottom of my right leg that wouldn't heal up, and it wasn't that I was ignoring it, but I was just so wrapped up in um, trying to make sure I didn't turn down any work, I just started a new business. Um, I kind of felt like, I. I was putting my health to one side and then when I collapsed at work, um, doctor saw me and told me that I, um, I needed to go into hospital because I had an infection and um, when we did the x-ray we found this uh, little bone spur here. Um, so that had to be cut off and then what happened is it's almost like my body suddenly gave up on me over the next two and a half years. I had to have 17 um, different surgeries. Um, to, to deal with various problems with my legs and kind of in amongst all of that my, my marriage collapsed as well um, and I guess my point for telling you this is a um, kind of change is just continuous you never know what's coming next um, but what I have found is um, the lessons which <coughs> I'm just about to tell you in the next couple of slides which helped me get through the original injuries um, also helped me with all of this stuff too so um, first of all this is um, a picture of myself and Lee Waters. Lee was shot on my tour um, three times. This is us training for the Devices Westminster Kayak Race, which we did in 2012. Um, pretty miraculous. We, we managed to complete the race in 28 and a half hours. Um, <coughs> we turned up on the race line having not even completed the total race distance um, in all of our training put together. Um, so we really were kind of cuffing it. Um, and at midnight, we were told um, our pace was such we wouldn't make it through the ATM cutoff um, at Teddington Lock, which is obviously where the 
uh, Thames becomes tidal. Well, bearing in mind at midnight we've been paddling for about 17 hours by that stage. Um, we then increased our pace for the next eight hours by um, two miles an hour, four miles an hour, up to six miles an hour. So an increase of 50%. Um, we managed to scrape through it and uh, managed to complete the race. So how did we do it and how have I got through all of this stuff? Um, the three rules of kayaking. Taught to me by a uh, geography teacher at school, Mark Neenan. Rule one is keep paddling. Rule two is keep, keep cool. And rule three, shit happens. When it does, refer to rule one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you take that word paddling and just change it for going, I think you have a pretty strong metaphor for life there. And I'm not joking, that is something that really has got me through. And it's kind of a light-hearted way of reminding myself. The next thing is... Um, about perspective and keeping perspective. Spike Kelly was a boss of mine um, when I was, I think, about 22 years old. And um, Spike was this little grey haired, I mean, I thought he was in his 60s at the time. He was probably actually in his um, late 40s, early, early 50s. Um, but he, he'd obviously had quite a hard paper round. And um, he'd kind of been everywhere, done everything at that stage. And I can't remember what it was, but I walked into his office one day, um, really panicked because I'd messed something up. Um, and I thought, you know, we were all going to get a bollocking from it from our <laughs> commanding officer. And Spike just turned around and said this to me, John, is anyone dead or is anyone about to die? No, well, it's not that big a deal then. What's the problem? Let's get it sorted. And for me, this was probably one of the most empowering moments of leadership that I, that I ever experienced. And it was something I really held on to for the rest of my time in the Marines. And certainly, um, it's a saying that I say to myself now and have done um, over the last eight years a lot. It's just about keeping perspective, um, just holding on for that one second um, before you sort of lose control of your emotions um, and consider what you say next. And then finally, um, this slide. I took this photo again a week or so before I was injured and um, this blue arrow is pointing to Mukhmud Saeed. Uh, Mukhmud, according to our intelligence, was the local bomb supplier in our area of operations and um, we would managed to persuade locals to bring him into the patrol base to chat to us and I went and then joined this meeting. Um, we operate under British rule of law when we're out there so what that means is uh, we can only arrest people when we either catch them in the act um, or have sufficient evidence um, to arrest them and we had neither of those at this time. Um, but I guess much like the police over here you kind of know who the local trouble areas um, in your area are. It's just a case of waiting um, for the right moment to arrest them. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine that um, after my injuries having this photo on my, um, on my memory stick was sort of quite difficult to deal with knowing that this guy was out there, he probably handled the bombs you've seen pictures of, um, probably handled the bombs that killed the guys I spoke about earlier um, and probably handled the bomb that blew me up. And um, I didn't really think it at the time, but um, I was probably pretty angry. And I do remember there was one moment where um, one of my corporals um, from the, so one of my men from the um, operation had got off and joined the special forces. And one day he was traveling to um, the, the airport ready to fly out to Afghanistan on a, on a mission again. And um, I just sent him a text saying, make sure Mahmoud Saeed's on your hit list. Um, looking back on it now, it's not something I'm particularly proud of. Um, bit of a stupid text to send um, for all sorts of reasons. But it's probably a signal of you know, where I was in my head, even though day to day I, I probably wasn't really showing it. Um, so kind of how, how do I deal with this? Well, you know, in amongst um, some of the saddest stuff I've, I've spoken about, you, you clearly realise that I'm stood here today with a smile on my face and there's lots of amazing things going, going on in my life. And um, it took me a couple of years to realise this, um, but there was a moment where all of a sudden I realised that all this fantastic stuff that was going on wouldn't be happening if I hadn't stepped on that bomb. And um, so I kind of had this moment where I went, hang on a sec, I can't, I can't be angry at this guy, because um, being angry at him suggests that I don't want everything that I've got. And um, so that was kind of the point where I realised I had to, had to forgive him. Um, and that was all well and good, but um, it took me another couple of years, and again, it's a sort of ongoing process, um, where I came to sort of further realisation that actually 
whilst forgiving him was good, it, it did help me a lot, um, what I was doing was putting all the blame on him. And what I wasn't doing was taking any responsibility um, for the situation myself. The reality is, is you know, I, I chose to join the Marines. Um, I've made an infinite amount of decisions leading up to that point in my life, any one of which could have taken me down a different road. And so there was sort of this realization that actually I need to take responsibility for it. And um, I kind of need to forgive myself. I need to accept that I've got everything that I have now, and I'm grateful for that because I've walked the path that I've walked. And without that path, I wouldn't have what I have now. And so there's this bit about acceptance in there, taking responsibility um, and kind of forgiving yourself. And um, I've got to say, in terms of you know going through what I've been through in the last couple of years, the marriage breakdown um, and all the operations, um, that element of it, that taking responsibility for it, um, and being very forgiving um, in, in the sort of darkest moments to myself and to other people um, has absolutely kept me going. And um, that is why I'm able to stand here with a smile on my face today. And so that's my sort of final message, which was the title slide. Um, if you can learn to forgive, then you'll be a lot happier. Thank you very much.